Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we have a decision from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. This is United States of America versus Kareen Brown. Kareen Brown was convicted and sentenced for various things as we're going to discuss. But her and her case is not really the focus of this appeal. Instead, the focus of this appeal is a juror who was dismissed from jury duty after the case had already begun in favor of an alternate. The judge felt that this particular juror was not able to render an unbiased decision. And the reason the, the judge thought this is because the juror said that they were convinced by the Holy Spirit that this person was not guilty of anything and was intending to vote not guilty in all the charges because of divine revelation. The trial court felt that this was not a good enough legal reason and so dismissed this juror. The Court of Appeals is being asked to decide whether or not the conviction was proper given a juror was, was sent home after they said that they were convinced from divine providence that a not guilty verdict should have been given. So we're going to see where the role of the Holy Spirit and the role of the law meet in this case from the 11th Circuit of the United States of America versus Kareem Brown. So let's get started with this. A federal grand jury issued a 24-count indictment charging Brown with conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, 16 counts of mail and wire fraud, one count of theft of government funds, two counts of engaging in a scheme to conceal material facts, one count of engaging in a corrupt endeavor to obstruct the administration of the IRS, and three counts of filing a false tax return. So this is not going well for Brown, who's being accused of fudging their taxes and committing obstruction, all kinds of related things. So things are not going really well. What did Brown allegedly do? Or should I say actually did because they were convicted? Let's read more. The charges noted above relate to One Door for Education, Amy Anderson Scholarship Fund, an organization that purports to be a charity that raised funds for, among other things, scholarship assistance for disadvantaged students and the purchase of computers to be donated to schools. According to the indictment, however, Brown and her alleged co-conspirators used Brown's official position as a member of Congress to solicit contributions for One Door for Education and induce individuals and entities to make donations to that organization for stated charitable purposes. But upon receipt of the contributions, the indictment alleged, Brown and her co-conspirators distributed only $1,200 for scholarships for more than $800,000 collected for that purpose. The indictment further asserts that Brown and her co-conspirators used the vast majority of remaining monies for their own personal and professional benefit. In particular, the indictment charged that they used the funds to pay for a variety of personal expenses such as luxury vacations and to pay for events hosted by Brown or held in her honor, including spending the monies for use of luxury boxes at sporting and concert events. So the allegation here basically is that Brown, a sitting member of Congress, was soliciting money for charity, but instead of giving the money to charity, she was actually pocketing the money for her own pleasure. So she was she was embezzling money, lying to the IRS, ma ma um, ma manufacturing charitable purpose or non-existent, all kinds of bad things um, just to, to feed her own lifestyle. You know, not the first time we've ever seen something like this, but, you know, hey, it's a it's a common story, but one that needs to be told again. Brown proceeded to trial on the charges. During the jury selection, all the prospective jurors affirmed that they had no beliefs in the case that would preclude them from sitting in judgment of another person. The selected jurors swore to return a true verdict according to law, evidence, and instructions of the court. During the trial, the parties presented 371 exhibits and testimony from 41 people. On May the 8th, after an eight-day trial, the court instructed the jury on the law. It told the jury its decision must be based on only the evidence presented during the trial, and it must not be influenced in any way, either by sympathy for or prejudice against the defendant or the government. And the court said the jury must follow the law as explained to it, even if the jurors did not agree with the law, and must follow all the court's instructions as a whole. The court explained the government's burden to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt required real doubt, based on a jury's reason and common sense after carefully and impartially considering all the evidence in the case. It then emphasized the jury must consider only evidence that the court had admitted in the case. The jury then began deliberately. Del the jury then began deliberating. So, so far, a fairly routine normal trial. You know, we've, we've got jury sworn, 
you know, we've got eight days of trial, we've got evidence, we've got witnesses, we've got pretty standard jury instructions. What could possibly go wrong? Let's find out. It wasn't too long before trouble began to brew. In the evening of May the 9th, juror number eight, who was not the foreperson, called the courtroom deputy and reported that she and other jurors had concerns about juror number 13. In particular, juror number eight conveyed from the outset of deliberations, juror number 13 had been speaking about a higher being in connection with Brown's name. The court deputy immediately informed juror eight she could not discuss the matter with her, but advised juror eight that she would report the matter to the district judge, which she did. The first thing the next morning, the court convened a hearing with counsel and Brown on the matter, which she stated for the record what had transpired the evening before. The district court acknowledged defense's counsel's point that it could be the first juror that's the problem. The court then reluctantly agreed to inquire of juror number eight. So first person we're gonna ask is the person who made the initial report to figure out if there's the issue. You know, we're, we're, we're very concerned about interacting with the jury once the liberations have begun for very, very obvious reasons. So we're very, very concerned about interacting with the jury during the middle of deliberations. So we, we have a very sort of minimalization uh, effort that we're gonna try. So. We could talk to juror number 13 first, but juror number eight is the one who's making the initial report. And so we probably got to talk to them first, but let's try to, you know, can contain this so it doesn't get out of control. Let's see how that goes. Juror number eight entered the courtroom and the district judge instructed her, before I ask you any questions or talk to you, I want to make sure that you know that I'm not asking you to, nor should you, state or reveal anything you said in your own opinions or positions about any of the deliberations that you've been having or any of the issues in this case, nor should you disclose or discuss the opinions of any other jurors about any deliberations that have gone on, so I want to be clear about that. The court next asked the juror to state their concerns. Juror number eight related she had memorialized her concerns in a letter, which the court copied for the parties. The letter read, Your Honor, with all due respect, I'm a little concerned about a statement made by juror number 13 when we began deliberation. He said, a higher beating told me Kareem Brown was not guilty on all charges. He later went on to say he trusted the Holy Ghost. We all asked he based his verdict on the evidence provided, the testimony of the witnesses, and the laws of the United States court. Other members of the jury share my concern. Thank you, juror number eight. After the court and parties learned of the contents of the letter, the court asked juror number eight some follow-up questions. In response, juror number eight said juror number 13 had made statements about a higher being when the jury first went into deliberation and had commented about the Holy Ghost shortly after, maybe just a few hours after. Upon further questioning, juror eight reported that juror 13 had not made any additional statements to the same effect, that it appeared the jury had been deliberating and nothing about the situation was interfering with her own ability to deliberate in compliance with the court's instructions. Nevertheless, Juror 8 expressed concern that Jurors 13's beliefs about a higher being and the Holy Ghost were going to interfere in his ability to deliberate in the way the court directed. Juror 8 also advised that some other jurors are concerned that it's affecting his decision. Then, in response to questions from defense counsel, Juror 8 explained that nobody had asked her to come forward with the information, that she did not think that the other jurors were even aware she had come forward, and she'd learned of other jurors' concerns about the statements during deliberation in Jurors 13's presence. The court thanked juror number eight and instructed her to keep this discussion to herself, and the juror left the courtroom. After hearing the party's argument, the court noted that people pray for guidance and so forth, and doing so is permissible and to be respected. Nevertheless, it worried if this juror is, in effect, raising some religious view that would prevent him from ever determining the defendant was guilty on charges or that Miss Brown was guilty on charges, that is problematic. Putting it in starker terms, the district court wondered aloud what would have happened if Juror 13 had instead said that he trusted the Holy Ghost to find Miss Brown guilty of all the charges. A pretty fair and astute observation from the court. You know, if you're going to allow one, why, why not allow the other? So if it's okay for a spirit to tell you they're not guilty, is it okay for you to tell you're guilty? Doesn't that undermine what we're trying to do here? So a very fair observation. Defense counsel then suggested that if juror 13 can come out and satisfy the court, he's willing to follow instructions on the law, the court should accept the assurance. The district court responded, well, I'm certainly open to that possibility, but I think I need to ask him. So the court decided to question juror 13. Juror 13 entered the courtroom and the following colloquy ensued. So now we're going to read this wonderful, wonderful description between the court and the juror as to the juror's thoughts on this issue. This should be very enlightening, so let's read on. The court. 
Do you remember back when you were selected for jury, one of the questions that I, the judge, asked you was whether you had any political, religious, or moral beliefs that would preclude you from serving as a fair and impartial juror in this case? Do you remember that question? Juror, I do. Court, okay. I assume at the time you answered that question, no. That's right, you did not. Juror, that is correct. Okay. And is that still the case? Are you having any difficulties with any religious or moral beliefs that are at this point bearing on or interfering with your ability to decide the case on the facts presented and on the law I gave it to you as in the instructions? The juror, no, sir. Court, okay. Do you consider yourself to have been deliberating with your other jurors according to the law and the instructions the court gave to you before you were deliberating? The juror, we've been going, we've been going over all the individual numbers as far as Court, yeah, I don't want to hear anything about the deliberations. Juror, yes, sir. But I'm just asking you, are you, do you consider yourself to be following the court's instructions in terms of the law and how to go about what you're doing, free from any influence of religion or political or moral beliefs? Are you able to do that? Have you been doing that? Juror, I've been following. I've been following and listening to what's been presented and making a determination from that as to what I think and believe. The court, okay, that's fine. So let me get a little more specific with you. Have you ever expressed to any of your fellow jurors any religious sentiment to the effect that a higher being is telling you, is guiding you on these decisions, or that you're trusting in your religion to base your decisions on? Have you made any, can you think of any statements that you made along these lines to your fellow jurors along that line? Juror, yes, I did. Court, okay. Can you tell me as best what you said? Juror, absolutely. I told them in all this, in listening to all the information and taking it all down, I listened for the truth and I know the truth when the truth is spoken. So I expressed that to them and that's how I came to this conclusion. The court, okay, and in doing so, have you invoked a higher power or a higher being? I mean, have you used the terms in expressing yourself? Juror, absolutely. I told them, I told them that I prayed about this. I've looked in the information and I received information as to what I was told to do in relation to what we're doing here today or the past two weeks. The court, sure. When you say you received information from what source, I mean, are you saying you received information from juror, my father in heaven? This is, this is just super encouraging for the court at this point. Let me tell you, I, 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 I feel like I know how the court feels right about now. So this is, this is just great. The court. Okay. Is it a fair statement? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying you have prayed about this and you've received guidance from the, from the father in heaven about how you should proceed juror since we've been here, sir, the court, do you view that in any way, as you know, when I instructed you, as I do for all juries and you told me, the judge, that you had no religious or any, you did not have any religious or moral beliefs that would preclude you from serving as a fair and impartial juror, nor did you have any religious or moral beliefs that would preclude you from sitting in judgment of another person. So you told me, the judge, that. And then you also, of course, heard my instruction when you have to base your decision on only evidence presented during the trial and follow the law as I explain it. Do you feel you've been doing that? Juror, yes, sir, I do. Court, do you feel there's any inconsistency in the prayer you've had or the guidance you've been receiving and your duty to base your decision on the evidence and the law? Juror, you said a few, you said a few things. Repeat, please. The court, do you feel there's any religious tension or that your religious and your obviously sincere religious beliefs, do you believe it at all to be interfering or impeding your ability to base your decision solely on the evidence in your case and follow the law explained to you? Juror, no, sir. I followed all the things you presented. My religious beliefs are going by the testimony of the people here, which I believe that's where we're supposed to do, and then render a decision of those testimonies and the evidence presented in the room. After hearing out counsel, the court proposed asking juror number 13, did you ever make the statement that a higher being told me that Corinna Brown was not guilty on all charges? Neither party objected. So the court, back, the court brought back juror number 13 into the courtroom and the following colloquy ensued. The court, if you could just have a seat again, sir, I appreciate your patience with you. And I want to understand, want you to understand I'm not criticizing you or saying you did anything wrong. We're just trying to figure out some things here. So what I want to ask you is a fairly direct question. Did you ever say to your fellow jurors or fellow juror during your time that you worked, that y'all worked together when the 12 stars, something to the effect of a higher being told me that Kareem Brown was not guilty in all charges. Did you say something like that? Do you say something like that or like to any of your fellow jurors? The juror, 
When we were first given why we were in sight as far as not guilty or whatever, yes. Court, did you say the words a higher being told me that Corinne Brown was not guilty of all charges? The juror, no, I said the Holy Spirit told me that. The court, okay, and you, I don't want to get into your deliberations, but what point of the deliberations was that? Was it the beginning? Was it early in deliberations? When was it? Juror, I mentioned it at the very beginning we were in on the first charge. The juror, the court then sent juror number 13 back to the jury room. With this information from the various jurors, the court is now faced with the task of trying to decide whether or not this juror should be dismissed for cause. Now, there are alternate jurors, so they can be swapped out, but by the same token, you don't do a swap out unless there's cause. You know, the jury is the jury. And so you only dismiss someone if there's cause. And so the court has to ask themselves the question, is this just a religious person just expressing general religious sentiment, or are they expressing something more specific? They're expressing that they cannot be fair and unbiased. So this is the issue now the court has to wrestle with. So let's see what happens next. Manitoban, in answer to your question about juror number 13, was one of the first 12 replaced. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how they number in this system. So it's possible that one was dismissed, or it's possible that they got numbers at some point prior to. You know, it, it, what, what might have happened, actually, is what might have happened is they had numbers in reserve, right? So let's say they swore in 16 jurors, right? One through 16. And then then they have to decide which of those 16 are actually going back. Now, different courts do that in different ways in terms of when they actually make that decision. Some make that decision like earlier and some make it like at the last moment. So it might be that juror, juror 13 just won the, won the race. You know, they are, their name was picked out of the hat. So it's not necessarily juror number 12 was dismissed. Um, it might just be the case that, you know, juror number 12 didn't have their name pulled out of the hat as they were trying to determine who was and was not actually going to make the initial deliberation choice. So that's why I think probably happened, if I were to guess. In resolving the issue, the court noted that a district court should excuse a juror during deliberations only when there's no substantial possibility exists that they're basing their decision on sufficiency of the evidence. Tuning to the facts, the court recognized that unlike other cases, juror 13 had not announced he was unwilling or unable to follow the court's instructions. Rather, the juror assured the court that he believed he was applying the court's instruction properly, and the court explained that the fact that someone prays for guidance or seeking guidance from whatever religious tradition they come from is perfectly appropriate and not grounds to dismiss a juror necessarily. Nevertheless, the court announced it would excuse juror 13 based on the following reasoning. In this case, juror number 13, very earnest, very sincere, I'm sure he believes he's trying to follow the court's instructions. I'm sure he believes that he's rendering a proper jury service. But upon inquiry and observation, juror number 13, there's no question he's made statements that he has, quote, receiving information from a higher authority as part of his deliberative process in response to the court's direct inquiry as to whether he had said to other juries, quote, a higher being told me, Connie, Conrad Brown was not guilty on all charges, close quote. Juror 13 said that what he actually said was the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit told me Corinne Brown was not guilty. And when a juror who makes that statement to other jurors and introduces the concept into deliberations, especially any time, but this happened very early in deliberations, a jury is injecting religious beliefs that are inconsistent with the instructions of the court and the case besides solely based on the law the court gave to the jury and the evidence. Because by definition, it's not that person praying for guidance so the person can be enlightened, it's the higher being or Holy Spirit that's directing or telling the person what disposition the charges should make. And basing upon my reading of the case law and other cases where religious beliefs have caused a juror to be struck, this statement by the juror, where he forthrightly admitted to and was accurately apparently recounted by juror number eight, who brought this to our attention, is a disqualifying statement. And, and it appears to the court, looking and judging at the credibility of juror number 13, that he is hesitant at first to explain how his religious views have come to the fore during deliberations. But as we progressed and as he told me he received information from a higher source, and then as he later confirmed the actual statement that the Holy Spirit told him that Miss Brown was not guilty on all charges, that he expressed views and hold views that I think are inconsistent with his sworn duty as a juror in this case, because he's not able to deliberate in a way that follows the law and instructions the court gave to him. I want to be very clear I'm drawing a distinction between someone who's on a jury who is religious and praying for guidance or seeking inspiration, whatever mode that person uses to try to come to a proper decision from the situation where the jury is actually saying an outside force, that is a higher being, a Holy Spirit told that Miss Brown was not guilty of these charges. And I think that just an expression that's a, 
bridge too far consistent with jury service as we know it. I recognize that whenever you have an area of religious belief and a person who has different ways of expressing religious beliefs, then you're in a territory that's difficult to navigate. But in my view, the record is clear that only did juror number 13 make this statement, but it appears that he continues to believe that he's being told by a higher power how he ought to proceed in his deliberations, and he shared that with other jurors, which again is essentially a violation of, not a willful violation by juror number 13, but a violation of the court's instructions that based the decision only on the law and the facts that were added, added to trial in accordance with the court's instructions. So the court is giving a very reasoned, detailed statement about why they're dismissing this juror for the record, because they are well aware that this could be an issue on appeal. And so they wanna make very clear what they are and are not deciding so that they make clear it's not based on particular religious animus or that the person is religious or even praying. The, the specific issue is the person getting a divine command, essentially, that is going to preclude everything else. And so that is the essential problem that the court is laying out here in their remarks. Ultimately, the court found beyond a reasonable doubt, there was no substantial possibility that juror 13 would be able to base his decisions only on evidence and law as the court gave him instructions. And juror 13 was instead using external forces to bring to bear on his decision-making in a way that's inconsistent with jury service and oath. In light of this conclusion, the court excused juror 13 for good cause. After seating an alternate, Two jury notes and 11 hours of new deliberations later, the jury found Brown not guilty on four counts of fraud, but guilty on remaining counts. Brown moved for a new trial. She argued the court had wrongly dismissed juror 13 because there was a substantial possibility that the Holy Spirit was actually the juror's own mind or spirit telling him one or more witnesses had not testified truthfully. The government opposed the motion. In a written order, the district court denied the motion. Though the court once again acknowledged that a juror is fully entitled to his religious beliefs and may espouse them, the court found that in this case, jurors 13 religious beliefs compelled him to disregard the instructions he'd received from the court and instead follow directions from the Holy Spirit to find the defendant not guilty on all charges. Indeed, the court determined juror 13's sincere belief that they had received instructions from an outside source before deliberations began about what the verdict should be. The court also specified that they found juror 13's statement that he was following the court's instructions did not convince the court that he was actually able to do so. Juror 13's seeming unawareness of the inconsistency, being followed the court's instructions, and taking supposed direction from the Holy Spirit reinforced the court's belief they'd be unable to follow the court's instruction even if again directed to do so. Finally, the court emphasized that its decision did not suggest that persons of religious faith were unsuitable for jury service, but only that all jurors must render a verdict based on the evidence presented in court. With the factual discussion of what the district court considered and why it made its decision, the Court of Appeals now needs to lay out its legal standard in trying to determine whether or not the district court made a mistake in dismissing this juror. Before we can consider the merits of the district court's decision to remove juror number 13, we must first address Brown's argument that district court should not have questioned juror 13 after hearing from juror number eight. We have held a district court enjoys broad discretion in whether and how it chooses to investigate claims of potential good cause to remove a juror. When it comes to a district court's choices concerning the investigation of alleged juror misconduct relating to statements made by jurors themselves, we have described that broad discretion as reaching its zenith. Nevertheless, we have cautioned district courts to be careful about invading the secrecy of jury deliberations and to err on the side of too little inquiry as opposed to too much. Manitoban, in answer to your question, what if someone does not believe in a deity to swear to? No problem. You can also affirm rather than swear. And you don't have to say the part, so help me God, in the oath. So they've thought about that already. So you do not have to, you can use the word affirm rather than swear. And so solemnly affirm if you want. Here we find no abuse of discretion in the district court's decision to question juror 13. Juror 8 reported that juror 13 had stated at the outset deliberations that a higher being told me Corrine Brown was not guilty on all charges. Juror 8 further recounted that juror 13 later said in relation to this remark that he trusted the Holy Ghost. Though juror 8 testified juror 13 appeared to be deliberating, she nonetheless was still convinced that juror 13's views that a higher being or Holy Ghost had told him of Brown's innocence would interfere in the ability to deliberate in the way the court had directed in the instructions. If you don't swear to tell the truth, does it render, render you immune from perjury? Sure, but you're in contempt for not swearing. Sure. If you refuse to swear, 
if you refuse to swear, then yeah, you can't be held under perjury. But you're not going to be allowed to testify, and you're in contempt. So, you know, you have to testify truthfully to a court. Yeah, you can refuse. You can refuse to be sworn in, but you can be held in contempt. The district court reasonably could have viewed this testimony as complaining that juror number 13, while going through the motions of deliberating, was not actually deliberating in the sense of evaluating the evidence before the jury, but was instead relying on the position of what he had been told by a higher being or the Holy Ghost. Juror 8 also stated her observation that other jurors had likewise expressed concern during deliberations that jury 13's remarks that a higher being or the Holy Ghost had told juror 13 that Brown was not guilty in all counts was affecting the juror's decision. The court reasonably could have understood those concerns as further supporting the conclusion that juror 13 appeared to other jurors to be relying for his verdict on what he believed a higher being or Holy Ghost had told him to do and not to do, and in the legal sense, to be deliberating. If, in fact, a juror was not actually deliberating and considering the evidence presented at trial to form his verdict, but was rather basing his verdict on what he believed a higher being or Holy Ghost had told him, this would present a serious problem, since it would violate the party's right to receive a verdict based on a jury who follows the law. Because the district court reasonably concluded that these very circumstances could exist in Brown's case, the district court did not abuse its discretion in making a further inquiry. Once the district court determined to continue the investigation, we cannot say it abused its discretion in choosing to further the inquiry by interviewing juror number 13. Even if Brown had agreed that the record could justify further inquiry, the court should proceed this way. Since we find no error in the district court's decision to conduct additional investigation by asking juror 13 questions, even if the court should have set up a different course of action after determining the need to engage in more inquiry, Brown invited any error that may have existed in this choice. For the reason, to the extent Brown takes issue with the district court's decision to proceed by interviewing juror 13, we do not consider the claim. We turn to the district court's factual findings. Brown and the dissent argue the district court clearly erred in finding no substantial probability that juror 13 was capable of rendering a verdict rooted in evidence and that he would instead, irrespective of evidence, base his verdict on what he deemed to be a divine revelation from the Holy Ghost. Instead, Brown and the dissent assert the district court could have concluded that juror 13 was expressing only that he was relying on the Holy Ghost's guidance in his own personal and actual evaluation of the evidence adduced at trial. We respectfully disagree. The court clearly erred in reaching the factual finding it did. First, we note the record here reflects no question about whether the district court understood the governing law. It clearly did. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. The district court repeatedly emphasized that people pray to guidance and so forth, and doing so was permissible and to be respected. On one hand, the district court properly dis distinguished a juror who engages in activity from one who holds a view that would prevent him from ever determining a defendant was guilty on charges, describing the circumstances as problematic. Put simply, the district court understood its mission was to ascertain, based on observations and the testimony, which category the juror fell into. It undoubtedly also understood it could dismiss a juror only if it found, beyond reasonable doubt, no substantial possibility that a juror was basing her decision on sufficiency of evidence. We review the district court's determination on this point for clear error, since it's a factual finding. There's no question that the district court, in reaching it, applied the correct standards. As we have noted, the district court dismissed Juror 13 because, after an inquiry and observation of him, it found beyond a reasonable doubt there was no substantial possibility that Juror 13 could base his decision on sufficiency of the evidence and the court's instruction. The district court reached its conclusion after considering and reflecting on Juror 13's own words and the district court's observations of the juror during the inquiry. Only then did the court conclude that Juror 13, regardless of his intent, was not capable of making a decision rooted in the evidence presented at trial and the court's instructions instead of being based on what juror 13 believed he was being told by the holy spirit to do beginning with his own words juror 13 stated he received information from his father in heaven as to what he was being told to do with relation to what they had to do here the past two weeks specifically to find brown not guilty of all 24 charges the dissent makes much of the second part of the question in relation to what he had heard here during the past two weeks 
The dissent constitutes this phrase to mean juror 13 was expressing that he's basing his verdict on the evidence. And in a vacuum, that's certainly one reasonable construction. But it's not the only reasonable one. The second part of the quotation could alternatively mean juror 13 received information from his father in heaven as to what he's being told to do in relation to trial generally. So it was the district court's job to determine if it could, based on juror 13's complete testimony and the district court's observation of juror 13's demeanor during the proceedings, which of these things the juror meant. Ultimately, after the district court heard all of juror 13's testimony and evaluated his demeanor, it found there was no substantial possibility the juror's statement meant what the dissent is suggesting. Rather, the court concluded it meant the juror 13 understood himself to have received directions from the Holy Spirit to acquit Brown of all charges presented at trial, irrespective of independent assessment of the evidence. And during his colloquy with the district court, juror 13 did not, on his own, characterize his religious inspiration as mere guidance. Rather, it was the court that mentioned guidance during the colloquy. In contrast, Juror 13's self-word response to the court's open-ended questions constantly characterized the message he received as a directive, directive or conclusion. As we have noted, initially Juror 13 stated he received information from my father in heaven as to what I was told to do. And later, Juror 13 confirmed he advised other jurors the Holy Spirit told him that Corinne Brown was not guilty on all charges. In short, without stating the Holy Spirit provided mere guidance, Juror 13 unprompted himself categorized it as perceived divine revelation as the Holy Spirit's conclusion. So as we've been reading above, the Court of Appeals is saying that the court below had sufficient factual findings for its conclusion. Now the Court of Appeals is going to analyze the question, given those factual findings, did it abuse its discretion in dismissing the juror? So let's see what the court has to say about that element. Because the district court did not clearly err in finding juror 13 was not capable of deciding the case based on evidence, we must consider whether the district court, in light of the determination, abused its discretion when it decided to dismiss juror 13. We conclude it did not. We are not persuaded by Brown's arguments to the contrary. She first asserts the district court could not excuse juror 13 because it found his violation of the court, court instructions was not deliberate. But a juror's misconduct need not be deliberate to provide good cause to excuse the juror. If a juror cannot base his verdict on evidence adduced at the trial, no matter the reason why, good cause to excuse that juror exists. For the same reason that the district court found juror 13 to be earnest and sincere in his belief about his ability to follow the court's instruction did not preclude it from dismissing him in the circumstances here where the court concluded that, despite his good intentions, Juror 13 was simply not capable of deciding the case based on the evidence. We would, of course, review such a finding using the same deferential lens we apply here. But on the present record, we cannot say the district court clearly erred when it determined Juror 13 was incapable of deciding the case based on the evidence and instead would reach a verdict based on what the Holy Spirit told him what the verdict should be, irrespective of the evidence. Here, the district court dismissed Juror 13 plainly and simply because on this particular record, it concluded as a matter of fact that Juror 13 was not capable of rendering a verdict based on evidence. Our holding today is a very narrow one based on particular facts of this record. That record reflects that the district court was very careful to ensure it was not dismissing Juror 13 because of Juror 13's faith or because Juror 13 had prayed for and thought he had received guidance in evaluating the evidence and actually making a decision based on that evidence. On the other hand, the dissent's position would unfairly allow a defendant to be convicted based not only on the evidence presented at trial, but instead on a juror's belief that a divine being had told the juror a defendant's guilt irrespective of the evidence. In fact, the dissent does not contest this position. Worse, in the dissent's view, so long as such a juror sincerely believed he's following the court's instructions, the district court would be powerless to preserve the defense right to be convicted based only on the evidence presented at trial. In short, we think a real injustice would be allowing jurors who are incapable of basing their verdict on the evidence to convict our citizens, and the Constitution does not allow for such outcomes. So that is the end of the case of United States of America versus Corinne Brown. In this case, from the 11th Circuit, we learn that Corinne Brown was convicted of multiple things related to false charity claims and was convicted and sentenced to jail. But more interesting, one of the jurors said that they were convinced by the Holy Spirit this person was not guilty and was dismissed as a juror as a result.
We analyzed both the reasons why the district court reached this decision, and we analyzed the reasons the Court of Appeals, in considering this, concluded that the district court did not abuse its discretion in handling the situation the way it did. And as the court noted at the end of its opinion, if you allowed this in the case where a person was being told by a higher power to acquit, presumably you'd have to allow it in a case where they're being told to convict. That conclusion, of course, would be untenable in favor of our criminal justice system where a person should be convicted only based on the evidence as presented in the courtroom. And so that is the end of this case. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support, and until later my friends, cheers and goodbye.